we're now going to begin um, a very important um, uh, talk uh, session. I'd like to introduce Marcus Mendez from uh, Sao Paulo, uh, who runs a consortium and has built one of the more interesting ventilators, which is very supply chain um, resilient. Uh, please take it away, Marcos. Thank you, Robert. Uh, my name is Marcos Mendez. I am a system administrator. I take care of a database of tickets for fixing equipment on the government here in Brazil for hospital equipment. Um, I take care for more than 700 and something healthcare units and 62 hospitals. And I know every piece of equipment in each one of those. Uh, the company is run by my family and I helped them in the last years to build this system uh, on an open source manner to help them be transparent and efficient on fixing help uh, hospital equipment and, um, and gear for, for the people. Since we began uh, openventilator.io project, the main problem from my point of view uh, is not to build a ventilator. Anyone with $5,000 can build a ventilator. Actually, it's a very easy piece of equipment. And uh, the problem is supply chain. The problem is to understand, like Edgar Morin, a, a French philosopher, says, uh, with a complex analysis of the situation, right? We are in a global pandemic. And let me try to share my screen. Um, Sorry, Chrome, okay. And this is the project philosophy that I've been run for the last time. Uh, so global problems must have global solutions. Um, we don't care about solving global warming only in Brazil because global warming is, uh, is a problem that's worldwide. So we have to solve it as the entire country, uh, entire planet, right? So uh, the second stuff is to understand that ventilators have been done by the last 100 and something years in human history. And also in the Bible, we have uh, someone saying that ventilated a baby uh, using um, animal, uh, I don't know the name in English of some kind of animal. So, for solving the problem in Brazil, we of course have ventilators in many, many, many places, but we have a problem that nine on each 10 cities in Brazil don't have even an ICU. So the problem is not the ventilators. The problem is that many of the places and the healthcare facilities don't even have soap. They don't even have alcohol for the doctors. Uh, I have a, a cousin of mine that's working with the same mask for the last two weeks in an intensive care unit. Uh, so the reality we have here is much more hard than what people really think. This is the phrase that our Minister of Health said to the people to use socks and uh, other kind of stuff as masks because we don't have masks. Also, uh, Teams making coronavirus research have been arrested and beaten because people don't want to believe that this is a pandemic. And I can see it every day on the number of people dying uh, and on the database, the increase of tickets on the uh, critical mission equipment on hospitals. This is evidence that we are living very weird times. So the project, <laughs> As since the beginning had to deal with everything that was going on in Brazil. Uh, also the overpricing of ventilators that the government was buying. So we decided to make a project that was very wide available on, so material agnostic, a project that was made for from the people to the people. So anyone with tools and resources and a few parts could build it any place, anywhere. And 
also our main standard was safety because we know that safety and risk management on these kind of situations is complicated. And the problem is that people are trying to solve safety problems with electronics. And we've been doing safety ventilators for the last 100 years without electronics. Mechanical safety, so mechanical valves, mechanical PIP control. So I think uh, before attempting to build a ventilator or before at attempting to solve a, a ventilation problem on hospitals, we have to see what people have done before. This is a map of the parts of Brazil that the ventilators are on the public, uh, on, on the government hospitals. And you can see here me in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, here down here is the most blue part. So we have widely available ventilators, but in the countryside, in the Amazonia region, there are even a state up here that you can see it doesn't even have ventilators. And uh, so for building something that is reliable, Robert, I don't know how much time I, I have left. Um, if you can tell me, just give me a call. Uh, so to build something that's really reliable, we have to take these designs from old times here and make them uh, multi, so they can be built with uh, a ma material agnostic and part supply that it doesn't uh, like, if I cannot find a part here in Brazil, but someone can find it in India, it's possible to build it. So. <laughs> Finish up in two minutes, Marcos, thank you. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, the other thing uh, is that all these machines are from the 70s, they are not from the 50s, and they are invasive ventilators. The problem of a ventilator being invasive is that on a very high risk of uh, patient is the, only, is the only way to guarantee that the patient is going to have a chance of survival. Uh, when we talk about non-invasive ventilators, CPAP machines have been proven to get uh, clinical cases worse than, uh, than invasive ventilators. The problem of invasive ventilators is also that we need peripherals like gasometries, oximeters, and blood measurement that is not widely available uh, uh, everywhere here. So the problems are not ventilators. The problem are uh, supply chain of equipment. And also that we have to think about the problem outside of the box. So if we have measurement, if you have a, a way of measure, measuring oxygen on the blood without uh, punching uh, with a needle the patient, and giving him an anticoagulant medicine, it will be much better to have an invasive ventilation and it will increase the chances of survival. So Robert, uh, I think my time is- Yeah, I'm sorry. So, yeah, Thank yeah, no you problem. Very much. Thank um, you all guys. So uh, once again, um, I'm afraid we packed a lot of information in here. Thank you very much for the picture from Brazil. I'd like to now briefly introduce Karina Malul, who's worked with the World Bank, who is from the Kenya, um, uh, I may have the, the name wrong, the Kenya Emergency Innovation Network. Uh, Karina, are you ready to go ahead? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rob, and really thank you to um, thank you to you and the team to organize this. This is really, really useful. And uh, we all, I think, very grateful. We, I once also want to say thank you for answering many of our questions and finding ways to help um, the network in, in Kenya. So I'm, I'm going to start with, um, with just maybe presenting briefly what we, we've been through with, um, with this incredible ride uh, in Kenya. So. Can you all see uh, it clearly or enough? Yeah. Um, well, 
why this started, I think it's all shared here. It's really something we've all been through and we uh, all know. And we realized very, very early in Kenya that there was less than 500 ventilators and uh, most of them being already in use. And very fast, there was like all these discussions and fight and panic that yes, the government was the government and business would do the right things and the donations and the orders and everything was go was going to go well. And uh, the first delivery uh, of um, ventilators went kind of missing and then another one went kind of blocked. So these things are, are common and and we know they're part of the very complex network of issues that de that define a little bit the background. So very early on, uh, we knew that Kenya would face acute shortage of, of PPE and, uh, and of respiratory assistance. And like, I think everyone on the planet wanted to do something, uh, we rushed on ventilators. <clears throat> and we met very early um, these, this fascinating global community of people trying to uh, race against the clock find solutions, give solutions, share what they were doing. And, um, and that, was in, that was an incredible energy. <clears throat> and I think it, um, it created a lot, of, uh, a lot of opportunities. And a lot of people said, wow, in Kenya, if we, if we had always done business like we're doing now, we would never be in the situation. The openness, the being constructive, finding solutions, being fast, being transparent, this also came with this, with this network. So there were a series of steps. Uh, a lot of groups were created first on food, um, then on 3D printing and ventilators, and then we had to split. So I think, I mean, it emerged kind of naturally. My, my background has been um, with, with the World Bank and with countries at war um, so and the when I moved to Kenya about six years ago I, I left the World Bank and I started to work uh, in business and in food sustainability in in social and impact business and I I branch into like a whole range of sectors but by doing this I was already um, being part of a community of actors that are really stepping in for key social and economic issues so from the first day, there was all these, all these groups coming up, coming up. And it took something like two weeks before being structured around work streams and specific groups. And we, as a network, we provided the medical technical advice. We provided, uh, we started lining up manufacturers, engagement with hospitals, engagement with the government and the infant rising. Um, and simultaneously, we started on ventilators and face shields. And gradually things, things came. Oxygen was on our priority since day one, but it just didn't happen. The connections were not there. These are very, very siloed and very different worlds. I mean, uh, the gas companies, the manufacturers that are mostly in, in their 60s, uh, the uh, the tech people, the engineers, the medical, these are so siloed that it was very, very hard to find the first, the basic answers on, on, on what are the needs and what are you going to, what are you going to use and, um, and if, even harder to get the answers. Um, so now we kind of more or less uh, set on these ones for the last um, three weeks, but it's likely to change and as all of you know, uh, we all react to the um, to the evolving knowledge. Uh, I won't speak too much about the ventilator teams, um, but they um, we started with twelve, and now there's there's four who are reaching uh, a level of going through the tests and presenting to the various uh, government entities. And I don't have a picture there because that's part of our, our issues um, and the issues I think, I mean, a lot of us have faced. Um, so our collaboration, uh, there were some wins and I think I mentioned them. We pulled resources, we were efficient at sourcing specific parts for prototyping. 
uh, we somehow brought some more clarity to the process with government and institutions, were able to involve youth, to have people working together they would have never met before, uh, leapfrog effect, and, and thanks to a lot of other um, uh, teams and, and network um, out there. But the obstacles, and I think they've been mentioned quite a lot now in this discussion, I mean, these egos, and it's when competition becomes kind of a bit blinding and people starting to close. And we had some of the teams just basically leaving the group because uh, they were told by, by the chancellor or they were told by whoever was the head of the committee that they, they, uh, they're not allowed to share anymore. Um, and yes, I mean, corruption is, is a big issue and, and, um, and we discussed it quite a lot uh, <clears throat> with, with, uh, with our colleague from, from Brazil. So there are there are major issues that are due that are uh, structural to collaboration, but are also um, structural to um, I won't say uh, third world country. I would say countries that are more uh, challenging infrastructures and uh, and resources. They definitely do. So at the network level, we had several issues, and I think some were mentioned also in the questions. Uh, we are still struggling to find the, uh, the right platform to combine nonprofit and, uh, and sustainable and impact business. And it's, it's not easy because you have people with different, different margins and people who are not willing to share, but they're still very useful. So this has been a kind of very difficult question we haven't been able to completely solve. There's been also some issues raised, I think, in the questions too, about the uh, legal aspects of the product. And even if it goes through all the uh, certifications, uh, these are nascent uh, structures or, cons or consortium. And we are entering a world we have no clue what it is going to be on the liability aspects. Um, this, I think we've passed the dilemma now about uh, We've heard at the beginning so many doctors then telling us, no, no never over my dead body, uh, I will ever use um, a machine like that. And then at the opposite, there were the other ones, like between no air and any air, I will take your machine. I think we, we went, we're now a bit beyond that because the, uh, the knowledge about the disease is better. We still have this issue about the responding to the short-term emergency, which is now a little bit diffusing because the numbers are not going so high and so rapidly, uh, and, and the need to be sustainable because we know this is not going to go away in, in a couple of months. So um, these are um, now the kind of what I would say the specific issues around the situation in Kenya. So you have the issue of power, I think like Marcus has, has, has said, and there, were a there was a team at the beginning looking at uh, renewable energy as, um, as a source, and then it, it, it didn't work. But then looking at the batteries that need to last much longer than the usual ones. Uh, oxygen has become uh, a very important um, now work stream for us because there's uh, a very, very tiny minority of hospitals who have, that have oxygen. It's going to be oxygen cylinders. And it resonates also with the, uh, I think one of the points that Eric said about the, uh, the hood being very, um, very um, wasting a lot of, of oxygen. So that has been, uh, that is now a very, very important issue. It's linked to my last point, which is theft, because in Kenya, cylinders disappear. So one of the projects is now to have a cylinder tracking system. Um, <clears throat> and that is, that is, um, that is, that, that raise so many issues on safety because they are they are used for scrub or they are refilled by non non certified um, uh, producers. So it's uh, it is a, a, a massive issue. Uh, like I think like it was also raised by uh, several presenters the fact that this interface and the fact to make the the life of the uh, health workers uh, easier is going to be essential, especially because the ratio um health staff to to patient is not going to be sufficient um <clears throat> and like like it's been also raised thinking about this thing and thinking about producing locally it means that we need to reduce the amount of things we need to import and that is that is a real challenge i mean sensors there's no way 
Um, we've had a lot of issues with, uh, with importing things into Kenya, now it's becoming better. Um, <clears throat> just the, uh, the, the 300 to 400% markup on importing, importing things into these countries. It's so been- Corinna, really I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm gonna have to ask you to finish up in time to let Rebecca speak. Yeah, and uh, well, I mean, you've seen the other points. Um, the last aspect, so in uh, 30 seconds, I think from the beginning, we supported several work stream. We had to move from one to the other and, um, and we continue to do that. So from our 12 teams, half of them have pivoted to other respiratory assistance uh, device and we try to support them this way. Okay, thank you. I'm terribly sorry to be rude. This is fascinating. I, I'm learning so much. I do have one question from Philip Bowman, who I happen to know uh, is a volunteer for Engineers Without Borders USA uh, for Kenya. He asked, can you quickly discuss pros and cons of improving an O2 cylinder distribution versus expanding availability of O2 concentrators? Well, there's 1,000 concentrator. Uh, we have no idea of uh, the maintenance, and um, so it would mean importing more. Or and we have one team working on oxygen concentrator, and they're not that well advanced, but we're still supporting them. Okay, thank you. I have another question: Are MAF flow air flow sensors available there in Kenya? And I believe what they mean by that is the flow sensors that you just plug into the uh, airstream. I mean, they're available if you import them. Okay. The uh, anonymous HND clarifies the question by saying automotive airflow sensors that can be repurposed for this purpose. Their sensors from cars don't work because they are mostly reading between 20 and 20 something oxygen percent and not 100 percent. And also they are made for working on high temperatures. Okay. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to go to the spec sheet to answer that question, but thank you. Um, Rebecca, are you ready? Uh, uh, we're a little short on time. That's my fault. Thanks. I'm terribly sorry to be rude to people. Um, Rebecca Alcock is a, um, a recent um, Master's of Science uh, graduate who volunteers for Engineers Without Borders USA, which, by the way, I volunteer for, uh, and she has some direct relevance. Thank you. Take it away, Rebecca. Yeah, hi everyone. It is such an honor to be included in this conference. I'm going to fly through this um, to try to keep us on track here. Um, I'm part of the COVID response team for the Engineers Without Borders crew. We started our work in Guatemala in about mid-March and we were able to move uh, really quickly. We focused on deployment rather than design of um, ventilators or PPE items. And our response has garnered attention from the UN Development Program, USAID, um, the UN Tech Bank. And so hopefully, I'm sure I'll reiterate points that have already been made, but I hope to leave you with some new ideas as well. So to just provide some context, this kind of all started and was successful because of um, partnerships that were established two years ago when the Volcano Fuego erupted in Guatemala. I was actually living in Guatemala at that time. And those bottom two pictures on the left are, are from my personal photos, um, but it was really devastating. But EWB came in and was able to partner with the local Rotary Clubs, um, basically the FEMA of Guatemala, so their disaster response organization, as well as the Ministry of Defense to rebuild after the eruption. So the silver lining and all of that were these partnerships that we were able to establish about two years ago that led us to respond really quickly um, in Guatemala. So this is EWB USA's mission statement. Basically, all we're trying to do is meet the, meet the basic needs of our partner communities. So in terms of COVID response, we've really focused on deployment and technical assistance. Like I mentioned, we're not doing a ton of design work, um, but what that looks like is personal protective equip equipment. So enabling local production of those things. I'll talk on the next slide really briefly about why the local production piece is really important. Uh, medical devices and ventilators. So we're working in countries where in Guatemala, for example, there are about 200 ventilators in the whole country and a large percentage of those are broken um, at, the, at this moment. And then also infrastructure. So helping hospitals set up isolation areas or um, fixing their water systems. Imagine fighting COVID without access to water, especially in a hospital setting. 
Um, so those are the three areas we've really focused on. And to date in Guatemala, we've been able to distribute over 100,000 units of PPE to 12 plus partner hospitals and midwifery groups. Um, we've also conducted a survey of the existing ventilators and we're diagnosing how to repair those and what we can do to get some of them back up and running. And then also this infrastructure, like I mentioned, we've worked with four hospitals so far and have um, a list to continue. So there are probably a thousand lessons I could provide um, about what we've learned over the past few months doing this response. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is just these big picture, um, the context surrounding a COVID response in an area like Guatemala. So the big picture to us means counterintuitively being very detail oriented about the non-technical aspects of design. So we need to approach these solutions more holistically and talk to our, our friends in the social sciences and in business, and most importantly, those with actual boots on the ground or like we, as we like to say, um, homes on the ground. So who's actually living and working and, and experiencing that reality. So in terms of deployment, you could design a great product, but if it has nowhere to go and no way to get there, all you have is a great product. You don't have a useful product. So for ventilators specifically, like other colleagues have mentioned, that means, is there enough oxygen? Are there enough respiratory therapists that can run these machines? Do you need to provide training? Is there a secure supply chain for filters, for anesthetics to keep the patient um, put under for the duration of the time they're on the ventilator. If the power goes out in the middle um, of somebody being on the ventilator, what kind of safety measures do you have? So that's one area is deployment. Another one, there's been a lot of fraud surrounding PPE. And we always say that these communities in these countries that we're working with don't have the money to make a mistake right now. We're providing technical assistance to make sure that there's some level of quality control, um, especially with importing certain PPE items but you really need to understand the bigger context of the country. Um, and then lastly, just the appropriateness of the material. And then if we need to find other secure supply chains for that country, that's kind of where that technical assistance or adapting existing designs comes in. We've relied heavily on the open source movement. So we really wanna thank you all for being a part of that. And that's been crucial to enabling the local production of PPE in these places. So I know that I'm out of time, but I will be hanging out on the Slack channel and I've got my email here on the next slide. Feel free to um, reach out to me with any other questions. Thank you.